Gentlemen, welcome back to the T. Shanley starting a business, building a brand vlog. This one, big number 198. So today, I'm going to get to a few questions. There are a few questions at the end of the vlog, but I would like to tell you about an amazing experience that I had this past weekend, uh, or this past week. So in last vlog, I told you that I was about to go out to Los Angeles. I was invited to this like YouTube dinner thing, and I had no idea what it was. I didn't even know. I didn't know where it was being held until three hours be before the event was supposed to take place, 7 p.m. on Saturday night. And so I go out. Okay, let me back up. So I have been on YouTube now for about 11 years, and there have been two times where I've actually felt like special and validated by this platform that I have given so incredibly much to. The first time was when Francis, my, my YouTube rep, came down to visit me. Um, I did a video, or actually, I, I, I think I even talked about it on this vlog. Um, he came down and, and just to meet me. And before this, I had a few other like YouTube reps that were, you know, like in charge of like a lot of people, but I never felt like special. And so, uh, <laughs> I, I sound so lame saying special. I didn't feel special. I felt like a number, just like one of the masses that YouTube could care, you know, zero about. And so there are two times, like I said, when, when I felt like valued as a creator on this platform that I love. One was when Francis, my YouTube rep, came down and actually hung out. We visited, we went and got coffee. That was amazing. And the other time was the other night when I was invited to this party, dinner, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But the deal was this. I got invited by Francis. He's like, hey, you know, YouTube's putting together this, this dinner for creators in different spaces just to get to know each other and just kind of hang out. Are you interested? And my knee-jerk reaction was, no, I don't want to travel. I don't want to go to Los Angeles. But I am so glad I did because it was a truly amazing, amazing experience for me. Um, the trip, it was quick. I went out there on a Wednesday night. When I got there, I met my buddy. I stayed at an incredible hotel in Santa Monica called Casa del Mar, which was ridiculous. The view that I had was amazing. So I stayed there, got together with my buddy Brian on Wednesday night, and it was awesome, right? We had a great time. We went to dinner, had a glass of wine. The next morning, I got up at 3 a.m. Because I'm a morning person. I tried to sleep in, but 3 a.m., West Coast time, my eyes, boom, open. So there I am wandering around the hotel looking for coffee because there was no coffee. There's coffee in my room, but like I was like, yeah, let me see if there's any better coffee. So I finally found some coffee at about 5 a.m. And, um, and then I decided, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go for a run. But it didn't get light out until like 5.30. So I go for a run at around 5.30 in the morning, West Coast time. So 5.30, it starts to get a little bit light out. And I'm like, all right, I'm going for a run. So I get my running shoes on and I go running. And I run towards... Venice and Santa Monica is like right there next to Venice and <laughs> let me tell you something they got a problem they've got a big problem with um, with with the amount of homeless drug out like it was so incredibly depressing at 5 30 a.m. running through Venice I mean the amount I couldn't believe the amount of homeless people that were just everywhere, like everywhere. You look out onto the beach and all you see are these things that look like rocks, right? It's homeless people that are covered with like tarps or blankets and it was, it was very eye-opening and very, very depressing. Just, it was, it was sad. It's kind of a bummer to see all these homeless people think. And, and when, I, when I see homeless people, I just think about people's like families. I think about the choices they made that got them there. And honestly, I'm a firm believer that we all are like one or two like bad decisions away from being homeless, living on, living on the street. Um, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, so went for a run that day on, on Thursday. I was getting up and I was going to meet Joe from Bloomon and Alex Costa at noon. We were going to try and film a video. And if you guys missed the video that Joe and Alex and I filmed, um, I posted it on Thursday. So we'll link it down below. But I had the best time filming with those guys. It was fun because I don't do a lot of collaborations. I very rarely, you know, interact in my videos. But this was just a time. We had no plan. Like, that's the whole thing. Alex calls me on 
on Wednesday when I landed, he's like, hey, what are we going to talk about? I'm like, I don't know yet. I'll figure it out. We're just going to have fun. It's an opportunity to sort of talk about your launch with uh, your clothing line from Nordstrom's and I want to promote enemy shades and, and let's just have fun. And literally that was the agenda. And so I came up with a few like bullet points of, hey, let's talk about like simple ways anybody can look great and come up with six tips and we just did it and we went for it and it was so much fun and the video is kind of like outlandish it's kind of ridiculous but it was just amazing just to connect with with two people in my space joe i've known for like ever and um but we've never actually met and so i gotta tell you i gotta tell you something about that joe character from bloom on what a great guy he is he's just a sweetheart and um He's just got this, he's just, it was great. I mean, Alex is a great guy too, don't get me wrong. It's not like Joe is amazing and Alex is like some dick. Like it was amazing. Joe, but Joe is just such a sweet guy and I just really liked him. I definitely didn't get enough time spent. I didn't spend enough time with those two guys. I would definitely go back out there and spend a whole day with both of them, just hanging out and kicking it, right? Because that's the thing. We filmed our videos. We filmed one at Alex's place, and then we went like right across the street because Joe lives across the street from Alex in Hollywood, and we filmed the video at Joe's place about hair, which will launch uh, later this month and, uh, or next month. And um, we just had a blast. It was just fun. It was just fun hanging out with those guys and just, you know, kind of just relating to them. That evening, Alex had like a launch party for his collection with Nordstrom. It was in like the Hollywood Hills at some like badass mansion. I saw some Instagram stuff. He invited me, but unfortunately, I had to go and, and do my YouTube thing. But, um, but it definitely looked like it was a lot of fun. And I'm just happy for him because he's worked really hard. Joe's worked really hard. They're just two good dudes and they work hard and that's what's really cool to, uh, to sort of witness and um, just kind of see. I mean, I've been here and doing this for 11 years, so I'm kind of like an OG. And so the opportunity to see some new guys, I mean, Joe's been doing it a long time as well, but just to see these guys thriving and growing and doing great things, it's exciting because they're both good dudes and it's good to see good dudes, you know, succeed. Um, but now let's talk a little bit about the magical evening I had with YouTube. And I say magical sort of with a smirk, but it was pretty freaking magical. So going out there, I thought that this was just some random, like they're going to get a bunch of YouTubers together, maybe like 30, 40, 50, 60. I had no idea. And they were going to have like a dinner or a banquet or sandwich. I had no clue what to expect. But what ended up happening was was just this crazy like intimate thing where there were literally seven of us creators and there were also about 12 youtube employees slash executives the biggest executive that was there was a gentleman by the name of robert kankel i believe that's how you pronounce his name he is the chief business officer for youtube and then my guy francis and a, and a few other um, YouTube employees were there. I got to meet all of them. I just don't remember everybody's name. It was all sort of just crazy. Like everything seems a little bit foggy just because it was so like, it was a whirlwind. Um, the location of the dinner was actually at the top of a mall. There was a mall, Westfield Mall um, in Los Angeles somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where. And there's a place called Italy which apparently it's like, I think Mario Batali was, is one of the, the founders of that or something like that, I could be wrong. But on top, above this sort of like farmer's market type, like Italy thing, there was a restaurant called like Terra something or other, but it was upstairs, it was like Italian, and it was on the roof of this, this mall. It was outdoor, there was a bar out there, all sorts of people, tables, and I get up there and I'm like, hello. And I didn't know who to ask for. I didn't know if I was going to walk up and see like, you know, 50 YouTubers. And I walk up to the hostess and I'm like, hi, I'm, I'm here for a YouTube thing. She's like, oh, yeah, over here. And she walked me this like roped off section up top. And right away, I noticed Rhett from, um, from Good Mythical Morning. He's like six foot eight. And I see him and that's when it sort of hits me. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm starstruck. All of a sudden, I got so nervous. And so I go up and I'm like, hi. And, and somebody comes up to me, one of the YouTube people's like, hi, Aaron, oh, good to see you. Thanks for coming. I'm like, this is amazing. And um, I'm like, oh, thank you. And I talk to her for a little bit. And then I turn around and Rhett is standing right there. And like I said, he's like six foot eight. His business or his producer was there. And he was talking to one of the heads of FameBit. FameBit is a agency or a business that YouTube bought 
a few years ago. And they were, I think, like a CRM network or a C. So they handled advertising. They had like YouTubers do like promotions and stuff like that. Well, YouTube was getting heavier into, you know, this whole influencer sort of campaign advertising thing. And so they bought Famebit. Well, the, the head of that department now was there as well. And he was like, hey, Aaron, I saw you on Shark Tank. Good to meet you. And that sort of made me like chill out a little bit. But it was funny because he was sitting there talking to Rhett and Rhett goes, oh, you're on Shark Tank. What for? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm a YouTuber. And I started to explain that I was a YouTuber. And then I'm like, wait a second. And I kind of had like one of those moments that I'm like, I am such a nerd. Anyway, long story short, I had the opportunity to talk to these YouTube executives and Robert, the chief market or the chief business officer, he and I were just standing there and, and he was like, oh, and he was talking to me, he knew my name and everything like that, which was kind of cool. And he started asking me questions and I started telling him a little bit about, you know, these new changes to the algorithm have directly like hurt my channel pretty bad. Like my views went from like 20 million a month to like 12 million. My subscriber, like, he's like, oh really? And he's like, I didn't know that. You know, of course there are going to be winners and losers. He took a note on his phone just about, you know, that I was telling him this and he was going to look into it, which whatever. So I'm telling him a little bit about my channel and some of the difficulties that I'm facing right now. And I'm like, I'm sorry to tell you. He's like, no, no, no. I love hearing this stuff. It's important. And, um, and so I, I talked a little bit more, but then it sort of, hit me. I'm like, I have an opportunity to let this guy know and these other YouTube executives, because at this point it was him and then there were like three other YouTube people from YouTube standing around me. And I said, you know, I just want you guys to know something. I said, I don't, I haven't had this opportunity to tell you this in person, but regardless of, of the problems I'm having on my channel and the problem, the, regardless of all the crap you're hearing from, you know, you know, advertisers and the ad apocalypse and all the crap that YouTube is taking, I just want you to know that you have changed. This platform has changed my life in ways that I can't even begin to tell you. And I love this platform. I just went on to basically let them know that, you know, you have changed my life in a way that is, 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 it's impossible to sort of put into words. And I said, you know, but it's not just me, it's, it's all of these other creators. And so I just want you to know this and, and it's important for, for you to know that, that this platform has, has changed my life and, and just impacted me in, in the most beautiful way. And so it was cool to be able to sort of tell them that. And the one woman that was there was like, that's amazing. Thank you so much for telling us because we never hear that. All we hear is the crap, you know? And so, I don't know, we had a great evening. I was there super late. Um, everybody was drinking. I wasn't drinking. I didn't drink because A, I don't drink that much. And I just wanted to be very present in this experience. And I didn't want to, you know, drink too much because I was nervous and, and I'm one of those people that if I'm nervous and I start drinking, a lot of times I will drink too much and I didn't want to do anything that would hurt their perception of me. And I just, like I said, I wanted to be present. And so it was a great evening. The food was amazing. I ended up leaving there around like 1030 and it was just, it was spectacular. And I was on cloud nine the rest of the weekend and, and, um, it was just awesome. It was special. It was a great evening. I had no idea who the other creators were. I'd never seen them before in my life, but I think they were all pretty much bigger than me. And it was just really cool to be invited. Francis came, we hung out. It was great to see him. And it was just this bonding experience for, for me and him, I think. The whole evening was amazing. The trip was amazing. It was really quick. I next morning got up and went home, but it was very, very special. And, and, I can't thank YouTube enough for, for having me out and, and making me feel special for once <laughs> because I definitely don't feel special all that often. And you know, it's funny because you work for somebody for 11 years, right? Think about it, right? I technically work for YouTube. I worked for YouTube for 11 years and two times I felt like, like valued. And um, you know, now, now they, but that being said, don't, don't get me wrong. I am not poor me. I feel value every time I post a video. I feel value the fact that I can do this for a living and all that good stuff. But on a platform that is so hard and that is getting increasingly more challenging, that is, has a lot of highs. It's got a lot of lows though. It was great to be able to be a part of that and just be included in that event. YouTube 
YouTube, you've got highs, you've got lows. That was definitely one of the big highs for me. Speaking of high, I want to get the, <laughs> I am so high right now, I'm going to get to some of your questions. I'm not really high, I, I, I don't smoke weed. Gary Hernandez, self-defense and survival, what's up, brother? He says, business question, have you ever had an employee that has been with you for years and knows the ins, the outs, the intricacies of your company, leave your company and open up a business very similar to yours? And if so, what can be done to prevent this from happening? So it's pretty tough to stop somebody. If they wanna come and, and take all of your good ideas, if they wanna go out on their own and, and do something by themselves. Now, the good news is that it's harder than it looks and it's harder than it, it, you think it is in order to start something. But you really, it, it's challenging to prevent somebody from making a living. And if somebody has, has the, the tenacity and the gumption to, you know, to work for you and decide that they can do it better, they wanna do it for themselves, then let them. I would say, if you're in a business that you're worried about this, if you sense that there's somebody who is really like a go-getter that's an upstart that you think, man, this guy is going somewhere and you know that working for you is not going to be a long-term thing that this person is going to want to do, I would probably try and figure out a way how to be a part of their business or how to work with them in order to grow their business. Figure out a way in order to team up with them or partner or be an investor or help them do their own thing. That way you're kind of like franchising a little bit where you know, where, where you are going to benefit from all of, the, all of the advice, all of the work, all of the stuff that you have taught them here, you're not just all of a sudden losing them and they're doing their own thing. And so I would sort of plant that seed earlier as opposed to later because by the time they say, hey, I'm ready to leave, they have stolen everything they wanna steal, they have all the names of all the people that they need to contact if they wanna actually go. And so doing something more proactive if you find somebody that's amazing, now the truth is a lot of people are not cut out, do not want to do their own thing or work for themselves. But the other reality you're probably realizing is that the majority of people that work for you don't wanna do their own thing. They are not that motivated. They don't wanna go out on their own. And the last question comes from DMT007. He says, business question. Your channel and brands mostly revolve around style and health. Have you considered venturing out into other markets such as food, real estate, etc.? Are there any business types you would love to start that are out of the norm without considering profitability? Not really. Nothing that I can think of. Um, you know, I do what I know. I do what I love. I do what I am familiar with. And so that's one of the ways that I've been able to lim limit my risk, right? Because if I were to go out and start a restaurant, I have no idea what a restaurant, like I have no idea what it needs, I have no idea you know, how to really market it, it's, it's, it's different. And so for me, one of the reasons why I've been able to be you know, fairly successful is because I choose things that I know and my, my risk is very little. I know that I'm pretty much gonna be able to do the businesses that I wanna do because of the audience I have, because of the channels I have in terms of marketing. But going out and starting something unrelated, at this point, I don't have the time. I also don't have the desire. I have you know, a few little real estate things that I, that I, that I own. Um, that is one place where I, where I do invest a little bit of money is real estate. But, um, but I'm a firm believer in do what you know and do what you love. And right now, I love grooming. I love skincare. I love sunglasses. I love hair care. I love grooming products. Like, I love YouTube, I love style, I love that kind of stuff. But I don't wanna start a clothing business because I have sort of messed around with that a long time ago and realized that that is a huge, it's a headache, you know, dealing with sizing and dealing with returns and dealing with shipping, it's, it's challenging. In terms of, you know, other businesses, there aren't, there is one business, there's one business that I would think about that I've actually considered, a salon. A salon is a business that I would be interested in starting. Now, I don't want to be there working it. I don't want to be managing it or running it or anything, but I would invest in a salon because I feel like if you're in a good area, you've got a good team, you've got a good staff. Because I'm friends with Steven, I know what those things can do. I also know what it costs versus what they charge for the service of a woman coming in, sitting down, getting you know, some highlights, getting a cut. Like It's crazy. It's incredibly profitable. Just to give you an example, the average ticket price of a salon, if it's a decent salon, is around $125. The amount of material that is actually used or the overhead for 
that, that $125 client is like $3 in product in terms of you know color and stuff like that. The rest is labor. A good stylist with an assistant can see like 10 to 11 to 12 people a day. And so you do the math. If you've got 10 stylists, like you can start to make some pretty good money. And hair is one of those things that's kind of a little bit more recession proof because women aren't going to do their own hair. Um, you know, guys might try to cut their own hair, but oftentimes the things that'll get cut in terms of the salon or the services, maybe instead of coming every eight weeks, they might go nine or 10, they'll push it out. But a salon is one of those things that they, they can make a lot of money and it's very little overhead and there's very little risk, honestly, but tying it back into the other question, salons are one of those, those businesses where people will, you know, a lot of times, you know, leave and they'll end up taking their clients and, and it can be an issue. Um, the other issue with the salon is managing the staff because <laughs> stylists dealing with, with that, 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 that staff uh, from what I understand from Steven is definitely challenging. And so for me, I would do it if I had somebody who knew the business, knew how to run it, and it was just me basically being a silent investor. I could be kind of hands off. But the amount of money these women spend on hair and products, my God, yes, I'll take it, <laughs> possibly. Uh, but hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, in terms of like me starting like a taco stand, not in the near future, but you never know. I will never say never, gentlemen. That is something I've come to realize. Guys, that's where we're gonna wrap it up. If you have a business question, down in the comments, please start it with business question. Next week, I'm gonna tell you about something really cool that T. Shanley did as a team. They went out to this neighborhood that was not real great. They handed out skincare to some people. They were on TV, like all sorts of cool things happening with Tiege, but I'm gonna tell you more about that next time. Um, I'm sorry for monopolizing this, but it was such a monumental experience going out and being a part of this YouTube thing and hanging out with Alex and Joe. I just felt like I wanted to tell you guys about it because you know them, you know this, you know YouTube, and, um, and you know Tiege Hanley. And you know that we love you more than our double monk strap shoes. Guys, if you've got a business question, down in the comments, start it with business question and ask your question. This blog is to help you. We want to be a resource for you. If you are an entrepreneur, you're starting a business, any business question, doesn't matter how big, how small, or what you're into and what business you're wanting to start or the question is about, we will do our best to answer it, guys. Because like I said, ultimately, this blog is about you and you being awesome and helping you kick more ass in life. Guys, thank you so much for watching. We love you more than I already said that, but I still love you more than our double long strap shoes.